is episode number 201 of Play by Play Cast, the podcast about play by play broadcasters for play by play broadcasters, hosted by a play by play broadcaster, a professional development pod that dives into the tips, tricks, experience, stories, process, and preparation of some of the biggest and best play by play announcers in the business or sometimes uh, executives in the world of broadcasting. Gideon Cohen is our guest today. He's the senior vice president at Excel Sports Management. Uh, thanks for coming by. Absolutely. Uh, first off, love the intro music. So um, that got me all fired up for this interview. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> my, my pleasure. Um, I want to go back to the early days of Gideon Cohen, because play by play was your kind of first love and, and goal coming out of college, right? It was it was I grew up, uh, I grew up in Westchester County, uh, in New York. And, you know, basically, like my dream was to be a play by play voice. I would, um, something I don't like to admit, but I would, I would record myself, you know, doing play by play, uh, you know, turn the sound down and, and do play by play of, you know, of Knicks games and Mets games and, and listen back to it. And I guess critique myself, which sounds a little bit weird. Um, it's and, what we you know, all host, do here. It's a safe space. So. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> host, host talk shows, you know, fake talk shows in my room. I mean, it, you know, it, it's pretty much what I wanted to do. I, I knew I wanted to do something in the sports media whether that was going to be a, a broadcaster or um, I did, I did really enjoy writing. So I, I, I was interested in possibly being a, a sports journalist. And then, you know, as you know, ended up at the only place you, you should go if you want to be in the sports media, um, which is Syracuse. I don't know if you've, you've heard of that fine institution, um, but uh, you know, basically did the whole deal there, you know, worked at WAER sports called uh, football, basketball, lacrosse, hosted talk shows, um, did updates um, and really thought that was where my career was going. And, and, and obviously 24 years later, it is, it is completely not gone that way. <laughs> um, I, were you an intern right out of college at if? Yeah. So basically what happened was I was um, I was trying to get an on-air job. I mean, I was sending my, my cassette tapes at the time um, out and and trying to get a play by play job with with you know local colleges in the New York area and had some pretty good connections at WFAN in New York and thought that was really um what I was going to do and and out of nowhere my my dad actually called me and said you know hey we we you know ran into somebody at a party and he knows someone who knows someone who has a, a small sports agency um that represents broadcasters and it's and it's called if management or at the time it was if enterprises and he said, you got to call this guy, Steve hers. And so I called Steve and, um, and, and I, and it kind of thought in the beginning that Steve was going to help me get a job that maybe he was going to represent me. And he's like, listen, idiot, I'm not going to represent you, but you can come here and intern and you could spend the summer here and, you know, work with our broadcasters, um, learn about what people make, learn about, you know, why people get jobs, make some incredible connections. And then maybe you can get yourself a job after that. And, um, it honestly walked in there, you know, thinking it was going to be a very short term thing and, um, loved it from the second I started doing it. And, and, and like I said, 24 years later, here we are. Not th this, this sounds like a, uh, like tell me everything, you know, type of question. And that's a lot. So, uh, I'll, I'll hone it down a little bit to like the overarching, do you remember when you first walked in that door and, all of those things hit you, that exposure to all of those things that Steve talked about. You can come here and learn this, that, and the other thing. Um, what stuck with you most? What did you, like, what was the biggest revelation uh, to a 22-year-old Gideon Cohen when you saw that side of it? I think the biggest revelation was there's no way in hell I want to be a sportscaster. Uh, really? Myself. I mean, it was, listen, it was, you know, it was a little bit of of getting inside the sausage factory and seeing how the sausage is made. I think, you know, understanding the reasons why people get hired, how hard it is to get hired. Um, the fascinating part was obviously learning how much money people make, you know, actually like looking at contracts and saying, oh, my God, I know, you know, how much this guy at ESPN makes now and um, understanding why, uh, you know, an athlete who's retiring might get a job and just taking a look behind the curtain. Like that stuff was was completely fascinating to me. But I also... I also gained a new appreciation for what play-by-play -play voices and other sportscasters do and just how hard it is. I mean, it is, it is hard. Sometimes it's not about how good you are. Sometimes it just is about timing and connections and relationships and, um, and so many factors. So I think that was, that was a pretty eye-opening moment for me when I, when I walked in the door there. 
Um, I'm going to pull this from a uh, an interview you did with Sports Agent blog. Um, a couple of things that popped out at me from that. But one of the things was when you started at IF, you learned about salaries, job openings, talent evaluation. Uh, what did you learn about talent evaluation as a guy who at that point in time is a talent um, in terms of what people were looking at that maybe you never thought of coming out of college? Well, I think the, I think the biggest thing is that um, it's really not so much what you're saying, it's how you're saying it. And I think also, um, you know, just just the whole process of like how people how people get jobs. I think that's something that, you know, again, we went to um, an incredible an incredible school that has produced, you know, some of the top sports casters in the business. But I think the actual process of why people get a job, like when you're sending a tape out to somebody and an executive is listening to it, um, you know, really what they're actually saying, you know, like, like, like sitting in a room with an executive and watching them um, actually listen to a tape or watch a tape of one of my clients was, was, was pretty shocking. You know, sometimes they would pop it in and after two seconds, they'd be like, all right, I'm done. I'm good. Next. And, and so, you know, it's like we, you know, our parents spend all this money to send us to Syracuse. We wake up at four o'clock in the morning, you know, busting our ass to get to the radio station to, you know, to do, to do sports casts that don't even air. We spend hours and hours on the weekends, you know, working on, working on things and trying to become the, the you know, trying to become the next Mike Tirico and the next Iron Eagle. And then all of a sudden you get to a point where somebody listens to your tape for five seconds and, and then says like, I'm, I'm done with this guy. So is like, damn, dude, like, like all this, all this hard work that, that we've always put in and that a lot of people are putting in, sometimes it is so subjective um, that, that somebody will make a decision about you in, a, in an incredibly short amount of time. And in, in some ways, that's, that's kind of scary. Well, actually, in many ways, that's kind of scary. So I think the interesting thing, and, and Steve is incredible with this, and, and this is like one of the most important things that he taught me, is just is learning how to communicate and, and learning how to capture somebody's attention in the first five to 10 seconds of a tape, because that's pretty much when you're going to make, the, you know, the, the first impression is the most important impression. Obviously that's a, it's a bit of a cliche, but it's extremely important. It's your voice, it's your energy, it's your passion, it's your on-camera look, it's how you're presenting yourself. And like, I, I would say at Syracuse, you know, we were, you know, we were very, we were educated in the, in the art of how to call a game. Technically, you know, are you are you saying time and score enough? Are you, you know, creating an illustration for the listener um, on the radio and saying right side, left side, you know, left block, right block? All that stuff is extremely important. But but what I learned, especially from Steve, was just putting in the effort and understanding of of the subjectivity of it and how you can control how you communicate. Um, let me go back to the very first thing you said, and you kind of wrapped it up full circle at the end, but it's not necessarily what you say as a broadcaster, it's how you say it. Uh, what's special about how the best of the best of what we do say things? So I think that there's, I'm going to give full credit on this to, um, to a guy named Eric Spitz, who is currently the program director at Sirius XM radio. Um, I interned for Eric at WFA in, in New York, as I mentioned, and Eric created something called the poke scale. And, and POKE stands for passion, opinion, knowledge, and entertainment. So if you look at all the top broadcasters, whether you're a play-by-play -play voice, whether you're a host, whether you're an analyst, you got to have passion, you know, like that, that, that's extremely important. You got to have an opinion. You can't be wishy-washy on, on, on where things stand, you know, should, should Dan Campbell have gone for it on fourth down? You can't say, well, you know, looking at the number, no, you have to be very, very direct and, and clear about that. Um, knowledge, you know, that's like doing your research, doing your prep. Um, and, and, and that's probably, you know, the easiest part of it, honestly. And then the last thing is entertainment, um, which I think is an extremely underrated component to the whole thing, which is that, you know, look, when you're on television or if you're on the radio, like the product is entertainment. And, and, and at the end of the day, if you don't understand how to captivate an audience and how to be dynamic, in your delivery, you're just, you know, you're just wasting your time, you know? So I think it's, it's, it's learning all those four things just to, to steal that from Eric. It's a hundred percent true. Like you really have to have all of those. Now from a play by play standpoint, you got to have a great voice. Like that's obviously the first thing that you notice when you're listening to a play by play person. 
Um, but I think all those other factors are extremely important as well. Let me dive into the entertainment piece of it a little bit, because and especially from a play by play standpoint, and, and you go back to like what we learned in college of like, make sure your mechanics are down and you're calling a great game and description and all of those things. Um, but especially on television, I, and correct me if I'm off base on this, but like, it's a TV show, like it's a sporting event, but it's a TV show. And just like you don't want somebody to change in the middle of a sitcom, you don't want them to change in the middle of a, a sporting event. So how much factors into when you're trying to be a, a network level or a, a big time team level um, play by play broadcaster character is the wrong word, but, but having personality that is unique and different and not forcing it, but just like you, you you've got to play a little bit of a role as opposed to just being a um, guy that points out facts of what's being seen on TV. Well, you, you know, you hit it on the head. You can't force it. And and I think that's the most important thing is, you you know, you don't want to you don't want to be something you're not. You have to figure out and this is why, you know, kind of coming full circle with a lot of this, like getting reps and 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 doing things like a podcast, doing low, low level play by play games. That's why they're so important, because you're developing who you are. You're developing your voice. You're developing your sense of humor. You're developing um, your big call. Right. So like big call is part of being entertaining. You know, like if you don't, you know, if you don't punctuate a big touchdown, um, you know, it's it, again, it, you're, you're sort of wasting your time. So I think it's um, some of the best play by play voices out there um, in particular have an incredible sense of humor. They, they'll keep you entertained. They also know how to engage their analysts. And that's a, that's another part of it. Like once you start getting to a higher and higher level, and you're actually working with an analyst and you're actually working with an analyst who has has a decorated career in the NFL or the NBA, like you have to engage with them. Right. And you have to be able to draw something out of them. And if you don't understand the entertainment part of it, it's going to be really difficult. So, you know, it's listening to what they're saying, reacting to that. Um, and again, that that all comes down to to what you said. It's it's a it's a TV show, you know, at the end of the day, like some people watch games on mute, right? Because they just want to know what's happening in the game. But there's a reason why they're listening to somebody broadcast a game and you have to enhance that. You represent not only play-by-play -play talent, but certainly former athletes as well who are analysts and uh, have jobs at desks and things of that nature. Um, when you talk about engaging those people and bringing the most out of them, I'm not, like I, I don't hang out with a lot of NBA players. Like it's just, those are not circles I travel in. I didn't play at that level. They don't know me. I don't know them. We don't run into each other a lot. Um, well, how do you, how would you coach people in terms of making connections and, and, and being able to draw the best out of an athlete who's at an elite level? Like if I'm going to sit down with Jerry Rice, um, what do you say to that person to help them get the most out of Jerry Rice on television that we wouldn't necessarily think of because we're guys that are sitting in the basement of WAER talking about, you know, critiquing our tapes <laughs> with ourselves? What do you what do you what are you saying, Joel? No, I think <laughs> I think um look, it's it's really important to 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 and this goes for anything, right? If you're going to go meet with somebody, if you're going to go meet with an executive, if you're going to go sit down with, you know, for me, if I'm going to go recruit a potential client, you got to do your background research. You have to understand who they are. You have to understand who you're dealing with. A lot of times I will actually listen to a podcast of somebody being interviewed. So if you're talking about Jerry Rice, before I sit down with Jerry Rice and have a meal with him, I will listen to an interview that he does with somebody um, preferably somebody that, you know, that I respect and, and preferably a longer interview, like, you know, 45 minutes to an hour of just him kind of being himself. And like, what are the things he's interested in? What type of music does he listen to? What's his family dynamic? Like how many kids does he have? Um, where does he like to travel? I mean, stuff like that. And then you're going in prepared, then you're going in feeling like, you know, the person, and there's going to be a bit of a familiarity there. So I think it's, it's imperative, especially when you're just like, you know, like a, you know, random play by play person um, who's sitting down with one of the, one of the greatest athletes of all time. Like you, you got to do your prep. You have to obviously show respect for them and, and, and what they've accomplished. And look, not everybody's going to be Jerry Rice, right? Like you're going to work with some people that you're like, I never heard of this person before, before I got the, uh, the game assignment. Um, but even then, like, 
the chemistry is just so important. You know, you're 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 working together on a on a product. Whether you know whether or not you like the person, whether or not you think the person is a great analyst, like you're still working together, and and that team camaraderie affects how the how the product um, is disseminated. And so I think like it is just extremely important to to build that chemistry. Now, if you're if you're on a regular NFL crew, um, like like you know Andrew Catalan, who's one of my one of my good friends, worked with my client Matt Ryan this year um, on CBS on on the NFL on CBS, and you know those crews they they literally go out to dinner together, they spend a lot of time together, they have meetings together during the week, um, and obviously in that in that case you have to just make sure that you're getting along with the person that you're going to be working with for 17, 18 weeks or more. Um, so again, I think it's just going in there with with all the knowledge, the interest, the curiosity of understanding who this person is and 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 looking to develop a relationship because the product is going to be better off that way. Is there something you would say to somebody who's, you know, like if we're talking about an analyst who's in the early stages, they haven't done a ton of games. They're not Jerry Rice. It's a, a guy that played mid-major basketball and he's starting out in television and you're paired up with him. Um things that you would tell that athlete as a client of yours um, that might be good to know as a play-by-play -play person in terms of making their experience as good as possible to get the most out of them. How would you approach that situation? Well, I think, look, like you have, it, it's such a competitive business, especially on the analyst side. So if you're somebody that, you know, played at a mid-major and you're not just a household name, which, you know, if you look up and down the roster, there are plenty of those that have been extremely successful in broadcasting and made it to the top levels of broadcasting. Um, but it's hard, you know, and, and you, and you're, you know, if you're Tom Brady, you're going to have a lot easier time um, acclimating yourself with all the resources that you're going to get from Fox. Like you're, you're basically going to be put into a position to succeed at all costs. But that's not going to be the case if you're if you're a guy who played in a mid major and nobody knows who you are. So you're going to have to work five times as hard. Um, you're going to have to work on you know again the preparation. Like your preparation has to be top notch. You can't you you can't just show up and say you know I watched the game last night and like let's roll. You have to you have to do all your preparation. You really have to work on your performance. Um, you have to become the best performer that you possibly can in terms of your delivery. And then I think from there it's like it's it's. You know, it's it's relationships. Um, it's it's developing relationships with network executives, with producers, um, having a good agent, obviously, and then you know working your way up through the business. So there's 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 a lot of factors, um, and I think a you know a, a play by play person. Um, I think it's I think it's a great thing to be able to help somebody out. You know, like if you know if you've done if you've called a hundred games in your career and you're working with someone who's only you know this is their first game. Um, it's just it's just good vibes basically to help them out as they as they start their career and give them pointers of like, you know, hey, here's what the you know, a lot of times athletes don't know. Like, here's what the director does, you know, here's what the producer does, here's what camera you should look at, like here's how to prepare for a game. I mean, these are all things that we take for granted because we just assume that that's what you do. And we've been doing that since we were we were very young. But um these athletes don't necessarily know that because they've been playing sports their whole lives. Um, I want to talk about you just starting out a little bit. I know we talked on uh, you getting that internship at, at IF right out of college, but then you went to CSTV and you were the head of on-air talent, if I'm right, for three years? Yes. Um, and there was, I loved the story of you like walking into the tape room and just looking at 300 VHS tapes. Um, what do you remember about those early years of walking into a closet of tapes and just popping them in and hitting play yourself? So, yeah, I mean, look, like, first of all, you're going to have to explain to people what a VHS tape <laughs> is. Um, that's the first thing. But they were these things that you put into a device that would play um, and we would we would watch them. It was but if it was you were lucky amazing. enough, they were in the plastic ones that 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 had to seal like with a click. Yeah. Or... Yeah. So it was it, it was wild. I mean, I, I, I'd love to look back now. Like, at, I, I swear there were probably 300 or 400 um, VHS tapes in this file cabinet or a bunch of file cabinets when I first walked into CSTV and, you know, like everybody was trying to, they, it was a startup network. So everyone's just trying to get the network on the air. They were like, yeah, we need on air people, but like, we don't have time to look through all this. And so they said, you know, well, Gideon, you've worked, you've worked in talent. You you've been an agent for a couple of years, like just see if you can find anybody good in here. And so that became, that, that began the process of, of me just like, 
you know, it, people still make fun of me that I used to work with back then at CSTV, where it was like, I just had hundreds of tapes on my desk and I'd be popping them in and looking through them. And, you know, some were, some were pretty quick, you know, pretty, pretty quick hook, but um, you know, but a lot of them, like, you know, we, we found some pretty good people. I mean, some of those people like Michelle Beadle and Adam Zucker and Greg Amsinger and Seth Greenberg. And like a lot of Tracy Wolfson was someone who, who did a tape for us. Like, it was a pretty incredible experience. Um, but I will say like, you know, you, everybody kind of starts to look the same when you look at 300 tapes. How many tapes do you look at or how many tapes do you get sent now? It's, it's, it's a lot. I mean, it's, it's, it's not as many um, as it was back in the day. I mean, we're, you know, at, at Excel, we're definitely a lot more selective on who we're, who we're signing. And, and so like, you know, we still get probably two or three people a day that are reaching out to us that are interested in representation or, you know, might just want some feedback on their work. And, and, you know, most of the time I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do that. How long did it take you to figure out what, what clicked for you in, in popping in all those VHSs? Yeah, I think that's the interesting thing is like when you're an agent, you don't, you're, you're not necessarily, um, on the, you're not on the network side. So you don't know what's happening, you know, behind closed doors and what these conversations are like. The crazy thing was like, I'd find, I'd find some unbelievable people and I would, and I would present them to the top executives at CSTV. It was people like Brian Beatall and Chris Bevilacqua and Tim Pernetti and uh, Lori Orlando and like some people who went on to do some really big things. And, uh, and I remember, I'm not going to say who the executive was, but I, I, I popped in this one tape and I, I swear I'd shown this guy to, to these people, this collective group of people, like at least five times. And I was like, this guy's pretty good. Like we should take a look at him. And every time they're like, yeah, whatever. And I popped in, I popped in this tape once and this executive goes, this guy's unbelievable. He goes, you see, this is the kind of guy we should be hiring. Get him in here right now. And I'm like, really, this is how TV works. So I think that's the, that's the thing that people don't necessarily understand is like, yeah, like there's people that are deserving to get jobs and there's people that are, you know, have been working at a place for 20 years and they want to get that promotion, but there's a lot of factors that go into it. And a lot of this is like human decisions, you know, executives are, are human beings um, who are making, who are making decisions based on a lot of factors. Maybe they had, a, maybe they had a, they're having a bad day and that's why they don't like a certain tape, you know, maybe you know, maybe there's a financial issue that that's happening at the company and, and, you know, they're looking for somebody that's more affordable. There, there's, there, there are so many things that go into it. Um, and, and that's kind of what I learned. I think at CSTV was just, you know, when I was an agent, I just thought it was like, Hey, we're just wheeling and dealing and we're sending tapes and hire my guy and great. And what are we paying them? And, and once you get into a network, you're like, Oh, well, there's actually a lot more that goes into it. You can't just snap your fingers and hire somebody. And, especially for me now, like I, when I deal with a place like ESPN, I mean, ESPN obviously has hundreds of executives, you know, thousands of on-air talent. Um, and so to get somebody into ESPN, it's not that, it's just not that easy, you know, unless, unless it's like a huge name uh, athlete. So I think there's, that to me was the, was, was the most impressive thing on working at a network level was, was, was learning how all these decisions are made. Did that person wind up getting hired at CSTV? He did. He okay. did. <laughs> um, the, I, I don't know if this happens in broadcast contracts, but like, what's the weirdest, and you don't even have to say who or what network, but is there like, what's the most off the wall thing you've had included in a contract? In a contract. So, um, well, there's, there, there was one contract that we did recently where um, the, the client asked for his girlfriend to be the executive producer of a show that he was on, his girlfriend. Um, and then two weeks later, they broke up. And so the contract just ended up being null and void. <laughs> so um that that would that would be that would be the most interesting thing that's I was that's hoping for just for. like they need red MMs in their office, but yeah, no, that's that's good. No, that that that's wild. But like look, a, a lot of the contracts are boilerplate, you know, especially when you're when you're dealing with a with a big uh a big network like ESPN and um, there's only so many things that you can change in some of these contracts, but I will say when you start when you, when you start doing deals for some of the bigger athletes, then it gets a little more interesting because then you know they they have a little more leverage um, to 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 make demands and ask for some certain things. I was gonna say, do you look at that kind of stuff with a different eye? Like when you look at Tom Brady's The Rage right now with 
all of the talk of going into the Super Bowl. Do you look at like a deal that he gets uh, to be with Fox and and Marvel less at him being on television and more at like the agent side of it? Well, w- with him, I mean, I think it's a I think it's a fascinating situation. You know, I think. Look, the money is is what's reported. I don't know what's true and what's not true. I think what's going to be interesting is there's a lot of just interesting things, but this guy coming in as, you know, one of the greatest football players of all time, and can he make that transition into being the number one analyst for a network, which is a really, really difficult position. You know, like you're not just showing up and and, and doing a game. Like doing a game in general is very, very difficult, especially for an analyst, especially for somebody who's never done it before. So what I'm interested to see is just how how he, how he his personality comes through. Um, what happens when there's a controversial play? You know, how is he going to approach that? You have to, like I said before, you have to be opinionated. Like if there's, if there's a, if there's a controversial rules decision, you know, you can't be wishy-washy. You have to be up on the rules. You have to know, you know, the rules change every five minutes in the NFL. Like you have to, you have to understand all of that and being a lead network guy, like there's a, there's a prominence to that. And so, and Greg Olson's done a phenomenal job. And so it's not, it's not going to be that easy to come in and, 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 and just step into it and, and be as good as he was as a football player, you know, right off the bat. Now I will say like, there's a reason why he was one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time. And it's not just talent. I think it's, it's work ethic, it's drive. And from everything I'm hearing, he wants to be the best of this too, you know, and he's putting in the work and he's talking to people and he's doing practice games and, you know, getting advice from a lot of, a lot of different interesting people in the business. So my bet is that he will do very well. Um, But, but I I look at it more from like, this is fascinating. How's he going to do um, than just the money aspect of it, because the money, the money's the money. Uh, last, last pair of questions, I guess. Uh, and we'll let you go on this note. Uh, do you ever wish that you, um, could have one like last dance as a broadcaster <laughs> and, uh, and what was the last game you called? Like, have you just for fun put on a headset when you were still coming up in the business? So uh, I definitely, I definitely would be curious as to how I would, call a game now like I think I'd be a lot better than I was back then maybe a little rusty on some of the technical stuff um the last game that I called well it was it was almost definitely um so I graduated Syracuse in 2000 and in my senior year our basketball team got to the sweet 16 um that was a team with Etan Thomas and Ryan Blackwell and Jason Hart and we ended up playing Michigan State um and the game was actually at Auburn Hills, which was, which is just like a complete joke. Like they basically got a home game and they were the number one seed. And that was like Mateen Cleaves and, and Morris Peterson and, and, and all these other guys. And so I called the game with, um, with this guy, Jason Chandler, that was my last game. Unfortunately, we lost the game and we actually had, we Syracuse had a 10 point lead at halftime. And, uh, and I remember Jason saying like, all right, all right, Gideon, take us home here. Like we're gonna like <laughs> like we're going on to the Elite Eight, and the Elite Eight was like a little bit easier. It was, it was Iowa State, um, which also had a good team, but we we could have gotten the Final Four, you know. And as like a twenty year old, like you're you're going on this run in the NCAA tournament, like you're traveling everywhere on somebody else's dime. It was pretty. It was pretty awesome, but of course I failed miserably. Um, as did the Syracuse basketball team. We ended up blowing the ten point lead. We uh, we 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 lost the game, and uh, and and my career was over. <laughs> so there you go. It's okay to say we. That, that, I feel like you're at the point in your career where it's just like, yeah, we. I felt I felt I feel like given all the money my family's given to Syracuse, uh, <laughs> uh, I can say we at this point. Gideon, uh, I appreciate you taking the time. Uh, I know your schedule is crazy, so thanks for carving out a half an hour and uh, and chatting with us. Had a lot of fun. Thanks for having me.